let's get into the presentation for today. And again, as Carmen said, uh, he specifically requested this one. I had talked about giving this presentation for a little while, and uh, uh, Carmen basically asked me to uh, customize and tailor this specifically for this event, which is what I did. And uh, this is gonna be the uh, background for this one. And it's gonna get into some heavy, serious, emotional aspects of what a lot of us go through uh, as uh, seeing people who are conscious and see what is really taking place in our world and uh, do the work of actually trying to wake others up to that. So the title of my presentation is The Sacred Gift of Anger. Yes. So let's jump in. Get as angry as you like. See, I threw a curveball there, right? You know, my, my tagline is usually get, a, get as offended as you like. But, you know, and this, is, this caveat I always give at the beginning of my lectures, because for people who haven't seen my work, I think it's important to make them realize why I do what I do. So this is mostly, it's not for you guys, most of you know my work, but this is for the people who will be watching this later. My presentation style is often extremely intense and at times even combative. I won't and I don't sugarcoat my words or my delivery. Some of you may very likely become upset or angered by what I will say during this presentation and so be it. That will never make what I'm about to say here untrue. The truth by its very nature is belligerent because it wages war against all forms of deception and mind control. I don't present this information to be liked, to be popular, to make money, or to make friends. It's great if, you know, some of those things happen, but that's not my intention. That's not why I set out to do this work. I speak publicly, and I have for the last approximately 12 years of my life, because I recognize that in the crisis that we are in now of overwhelming ignorance and deception, I have a moral obligation to communicate what I know to be taking place in our world to others in an effort to help them to understand it so then they can take action and do something about it. This has been, I, I feel, a very good common thread that I have heard from a lot of the other speakers of this event. And I like to hear that and I wanna hear more of it, that you guys should not just be the ones in attendance. A lot of you guys know this stuff and should be teaching it to others by this point already. This is about, I am up here to try to inspire you to take the action to do what the speakers here today are doing. And you could do it in different ways. Not everybody has to do it the same way, okay? But it is about getting on the battlefield. It is about actually actively engaging and taking part in this war for our freedom. And that's what the One Great Worker War is about. It's about people who are doing it and who I feel are doing it effectively. And I know that there's many more potential teachers in the audience. So that's one of the main reasons that I uh, speak to people to try to help inspire other teachers to come forward and teach this stuff. So when we're talking about anger, there's no better poster child than right there, okay? <laughs> I figured let's start with the self, right? That's where this whole thing begins. It begins and ends with the self. So, you know, I have really expressed this emotion a lot, especially recently for what I see in the world. Uh, freedom of speech being just thrown on the ground and tread upon, you know? Our, what are supposed to be our inalienable birthrights as human beings being practically discarded, okay? My anger recently has ranged from mild annoyance to white hot rage, okay? What I wanna talk about here today is the emotion of anger as something that can actually assist us. People see it always as negative and we're gonna talk about why that is. But if it's used properly, it can actually be a fuel of sorts, as I'm going to talk about. But what I hear from a lot of people in, you know, the, the audience, okay, the people who aren't actually, actually doing the work, but who are absorbing it, taking it in, right? 
and you know, not people who are at an event like this, but you know, real armchair quarterbacks out there. We all know who people like that, you know, who can talk and talk and talk and criticize. But when it, when you ask the question, "What are you doing?" you hear the crickets chirping, you know. So, you know, people will say, "Take Mark with a grain of salt," you know, or "I don't trust his information because of." It's coming from a place of anger, right? The, the, I'll, I'll hear, I've read on forums or on YouTube, why not listen to somebody else who presents it in a more calm, easygoing, dispassionate, disconnected way, you know, like, like not as emotionally involved, right? Somebody like Manly P. Hall. Now, I have great respect for the teacher Manly P. Hall. I think he is one of the greatest esoteric teachers ever, okay? However, if you listen to the, the dichotomy in styles between someone like me and someone like Manly P. Hall, you'll see what I'm talking about. There, it, it's, it's a very um, emotionally detached presentation style, whereas I tend to present with passion and emotion. That's my style. That's my personality. I have no intention of changing that. That's who I really am. That's who I've always been, okay? Now, I'm not saying you can't learn a great deal from Manly P. Hall and, or that you shouldn't absolutely take in his work, but be prepared to hear an older gentleman with an extremely monotone voice speaking slowly and dispassionately pretty much through the in whole duration of his lectures. Now, people will say, because he's delivering it dispassionately, and sometimes I'm yelling into the camera, that somehow that will negate the truthfulness or the veracity of what I'm saying because it's delivered with righteous indignation, righteous anger. So my question here is, see, a lot of people want to work with other people's biases and their mental inconsistencies. I don't want to work with those things. I don't want to capitulate to those things. I want to point them out. I want to explain to people, here's a mind control technique that you fall and pray to. Look at it. Ask yourself, why? Is that your own thought? Or is that a virus that's been inserted into the mind that someone else wants you to think? So my question here is, when it comes to two radically different delivery styles, does delivery change the truth of the matter? Or does the truth remain the truth regardless of delivery style? And I think if we're being honest with ourselves, as we should, we should realize that regardless of how something is said or presented, truth remains the truth. For people to believe that if you say it nice and calmly with a wonderful, sweet tone, that somehow that makes it more true than saying, you better fucking wake up and listen! Because we're on a really bad path, and if we don't change it, there's not going to be much time left for us as a species. Does it make it any less true, how it is said? How about if we look at it on the flip side? What if we turn the tables completely and say, what about this delivery style? What about people who are paid propagandists for the powers that be in our world? Hired by intelligence agencies in many cases. What about their delivery style? Because they wear $3,000 suits and have their hair done at the finest salons and sit there, you know, looking as good as possible and delivering their absolute forked tongue lies with a sweet and pleasant voice, does that make it any more true? See, this is, this is, we have to put these dynamics out there for people to consider. Why would anyone think because someone may even be rambling in a completely frenzied way that that somehow has anything whatsoever to do with the truthfulness of what is being said? See, I don't listen for emotional aspects when something's being said. I listened for only one thing, and that is whether or not the information being spoken is true 
or untrue. And this is part of the logical reasoning process of being able to actually think for oneself, which we know that this control system, especially through education, is trying to violently rip away from people the ability to think critically like that. And that's why we don't even think about a lot of these things, about does delivery change truth? So when it comes to the prostitute media, does their delivery change the truth of what they're saying? I would suggest it absolutely does not. So as we explore this, I want you to keep those aspects in mind. And when any anger does come up or rear its head in your emotional response, you have to ask, is that actually coming from me? Or is that that mind control virus that's been planted there by someone else, by social engineers? This is the dynamic that I call, in my work, emotional mind control. I've also referred to it as heart control, okay? Because you are actually playing on someone's emotional responses in their body and in the way that their emotions make them feel to try to distort how they think about information coming in. So, an extremely popular technique of social engineering is to dissuade people from considering any information that is presented with righteous anger or extreme passion. The occult mind controllers of our world desperately want us to believe that truth must only be delivered in a calm, soothing, and dispassionate tone of voice. Yet, to accept this as true is a complete logical fallacy. Of course it is true that even if truth is ang angrily screamed in our face, it still remains true. And of course it is true that even if a lie is spoken in the most appealing tone possible, it still remains false. This is what it means to reason clearly and use logic to come, use the actual process of logic, the trivium process, grammar, assembling all the data, logic, processing it accurately and weeding out logical inconsistencies and then rhetoric, putting it into action in our lives. This is what it means to think and reason critically. And unfortunately, most of the population believes the bullshit that they believe because they don't have those reasoning processes intact in their mind. So we should not, never fall victim to this technique because this is a technique of mind controllers, of social engineers working in think tanks to try to completely skew people's understanding of events that are taking place in our world by playing on their emotions and getting them to fall victim to this tactic called emotional mind control. So why is it that most people are socially conditioned to think that anger is only a negative emotion? Only, that's the key word there, okay? Most people you say, is anger positive or negative? They're gonna say, it's negative. And there are lots of forms of negative anger that I'm not telling people to go and engage in and stay in, okay? I'm talking about a particular type of anger, which is what we're gonna talk about next, the types of anger. But why do people, most people in our society, think that anger is only negative? That there are no positive usages for it? or that there's not really a reason we should feel it and express it, and there most certainly is. There is an agenda, there is a social engineering agenda to purge anger in our population. And let me tell you something, folks, it's working, because people at this point should be enraged over the loss of freedom, and many of them can't even feel anger at all. We're gonna talk about those kind of people. Anger is widely misperceived in human society as only a negative emotion. The expression of anger is discouraged and is widely culturally perceived to be wrong or bad. The perception of anger as a negative emotion comes from a lack of understanding that the emotion of anger exists for a valid purpose. 
This misunderstanding is deliberately propagated throughout our culture as part of an agenda to modify human behavior in such a way as to make any resistance or rebellion against government tyranny completely impossible. Because it ultimately resistance and or rebellion starts with getting angry about injustice. From childhood, we are influenced by this agenda to believe that anger should be purged or done away with, or that we shouldn't feel it or express it, and those who do express anger should be shunned and shamed without ever even asking the most important question regarding the expression of anger. Why is this person angry? See, most people hear an angry person saying whatever they're saying in an angry tone of voice, and they want to, they're, they're emotionally conditioned to tune out and dismiss what's being said without first asking the question, is this a valid reason for anger? Let me hear what the person is actually saying. Why are they expressing this seemingly negative emotion? See, most people never do that process. They never ask, what is the purpose for this expression of emotion? They just react to it. That's mind control. We have to stop when anger is being expressed and say, why is the person angry? Why are they expressing this emotion? Is it for a valid purpose or is it for a frivolous purpose? And yes, there is a distinction. Yes, there is. We should exercise that kind of judgment between the different forms or types of anger. So let's explore what those are. There are two overarching main types of anger. The first is the unproductive type, the part that really, the type that really is negative and that we could probably deal with, have a lot less of it in our lives. It's what I simply refer to as petty anger. Petty anger has these types of characteristics. It is expressed over vapid concerns and displeasure in trivial situations, things that don't really matter, in other words, or that are completely frivolous. It is based almost entirely in pure ego and selfishness. People are just, in this type of anger, just angry over, this happened to me, 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 or I didn't get my way, okay? So it's, it's based in just service to self. The person didn't get what they expected out of a particular situation and therefore they're throwing a hissy fit. This type of anger, petty anger, accomplishes nothing regarding the betterment of human life. It's not expressed for that purpose. It's expressed for the purpose of the ego lashing out. Okay? So that's the first kind of anger. and That's not the kind of anger I'm talking about in this presentation, obviously. We're talking about what I am calling the sacred gift of anger. Anger in the form that the intelligence of all creation enabled in our physiology for a reason. That's no accident. That was done for a purpose, okay? And that is this kind of anger. It's righteous indignation. These are people yelling at police that uh, it's a protest uh, about... Um, uh, the, the gentleman from England who just went to jail over freedom of speech and just reporting, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Tommy Robinson, yes, uh, his name escaped me briefly. Uh, th you know, th th this person just co wanted to cover things that were going on with corruption within the local government in the UK and literally went to jail for reporting for journalism. That's how far into the destruction of freedom of speech the United Kingdom is. And let me tell you something, folks. That's where the highest levels of social engineers operate, out of Tavistock Institute of Human Relations in London. And everything that they cook up there in that shit center, okay, of, you know, scumbag intelligence agents and other, you know, old English farts that want to control everybody's lives because they're pieces of shit as human beings, Okay? Guaranteed what they're doing there amongst their own population is going to follow across the pond and it's going to be attempted to be carried out here within five to ten years tops. I'm going to say five years. It's a model 
that they work with like clockwork because they're like reptilians in their minds and they never deviate from a plan that continues to work because the population doesn't get how the, the psychological warfare tactic is being waged against them. So, you know, this type of shutting down of freedom of speech is coming here. And you do see a little bit of this type of anger, righteous indignation against the loss of a right. All too little, though, you know, the person is still, right now, as we speak in a jail cell, is freedom of speech being heralded as something we should try to totally protect in England, or even here for that matter? No. People who don't have their opinions agreed with want to shut down the opinions of, of their so-called enemy or opponent, you know? So, it's about what we get angry about. What are we willing to actually express what is a seemingly negative emotion over? What is the issue over? So righteous indignation is expressed over critically important concerns, things that really matter in our lives, like our rights, our freedom. It's based in, righteous indignation is based in fierce opposition to wrongdoing and a fierce and a correct sense of morality and justice. Fierce opposition to injustice and a totally correct sense and an allegiance with a loyalty to morality and justice. That's where this place, this emotion of anger, the, that's the place it's coming from. And that really means it's coming from the heart. Righteous indignation is always aimed toward the betterment of human life by righting wrongs, by correcting wrongdoings, or correcting injustices in our society, legitimate injustices. You know, we're not talking about the social justice warrior type of anger here. We're talking about legitimate, righteous indignation to the loss of freedom and rights and other injustices done in our society. So my question for the listening audience here today, but mostly for the people viewing this on the internet, what makes you angry? You know, the, I'm talking to the people who don't really know my work that well. What actually makes you angry? You know, this is a question for the, quote, normies. But before we answer it, it was Abraham Lincoln who once said, you can tell the greatness of a man by what makes him angry. So say what you will about Lincoln, okay? Obviously, you know, uh, flip side to, to, you know, his agendas and who he worked with as president, okay? But regardless of what you think of him as a historical figure, the quote here is highly apropos to this presentation because what we're talking about is what is the person expressing the anger about? Is it valid, righteous indignation, or is it vapid concerns that don't matter? So he's sa saying you can actually tell what's in the heart of another human being. Forget the word man. You could use the word human in place of that, okay, man or woman. What makes a man or a woman great is what makes them angry? What will they get upset about when they see it happening in their midst, in their society? Because a truly great person, a truly good person, will be angry about the injustices regarding human rights and freedom that's taking place all around them. Bad people don't give a shit. Bad people who only give a shit about themselves don't care at all about rights and freedom being lost unless it happened in the moment to be happening to them. But they'll see it happen in their society and look the other way, walk the other way. None of my business. You know? That's what he's talking about here. If a real issue truly makes someone angry in a sense of righteous indignation, that's a sense of that person's goodness. You know, we don't look at anger like that, though, in society, do we? Largely. You don't think of many people as thinking that way. Most people say, oh, what the fuck's he angry about? What's he so angry about? Why does he have a board up his ass? You know? That's what they'll say. But they'll never even stop to ask the question, why are you angry about this particular situation or circumstance? Here's what the modern world gets angry about. Here's what modern so-called men get angry about. Oh, my God, my football. Look at that coaching decision. They got to fire that asshole. You know? 
I mean, these are people who actually think they're adult male human beings that are, that are getting angry and, and getting emotionally involved in a goddamn child's game, you know, and will call themselves men. They couldn't spell that three-letter word, let alone understand what it means to be one. You know, do we get angry in traffic? You know, road rage? You know, in a situation that really, you know, we have no control over, but really doesn't need to exist because, you know, we could have anti-gravitic propulsion by now for, for over 100 years or more, but that's suppressed, but, you know... We're not getting angry that we are still in a car when we should be in some type of an anti-gravitic craft traveling to wherever on the earth we want unrestrained. That's not why they're angry. They're just angry because, oh, that person cut me off in traffic, you know? Are we angry on uh, social media, arguing with people on the Internet? Someone was wrong on the Internet, you know. I have to just freak out about it. You know, how many people like, you know, live in this state where they'll go back and forth in an argument with people on social media like 89,000 times? Or are we angry about the things that really matter? The encroaching police state, the shutdown of freedom of speech, the unrestrained violence being done by the police and military in the world, no matter what country or government they're from. Are people angry about those things? Are they angry about their rights going down the toilet? Or are they angry about the football game not working out the way, you know, they wanted it to work out? Because we didn't win. Yeah. Are they angry about tyranny on the rise? You know, most people don't even give it a second thought in our society, let alone express any anger over it, any righteous indignation. Are we angry about the pedophile rings that really are operating at the highest levels of government yeah. and, and the rape and torture of children that's taking place, not only for political blackmail, which is certainly a part of it, but for just the absolute desecration of the human spirit and soul as part of a worldwide agenda of Satanism because that's what really runs this game. You know, most people don't even understand the Epstein situation. They don't know who that person is. They don't really know the depth of it. And now, you know, one mass shooting later, keep it's all quiet again. You know, one, one, the next false flag shuts everybody up asking questions about pedophile rings at the highest levels of government and why that's being done. Now, people aren't angry about that, though. They're not angry over the censorship of big tech trying to control what we can and can't say, trying to make it impossible for us to reach people with a message of freedom and the non-aggression principle and true peace and enlightenment. You know, that's my line in the sand. You're not going to stop me from talking. You know, I'm going to talk until the day I die. I'm going to deliver this message till the day I leave this this plane of existence. And anybody who tries to stop me will be from speaking will be met with physical force. I will not accept that someone is going to shut down my freedom of speech. See, they want to do it digitally to get people used to it before they start doing it physically like they're doing in the UK and in the rest of Europe right now. But America is not going down that path. Not as long as I have anything whatsoever to do with it and as long as I'm living and breathing. So that's right, what people should have righteous indignation about. Are we angry that we're living on a prison planet? Are we angry that government is slavery? Are, there, are we angry that there are people who actually think they're God and we're their slaves? You know? These are the things we should be angry about. But if you just think about it percentage-wise throughout the whole human population, how many people have righteous indignation over those type of things? Far too few. As a matter of fact, I would call it a piss-in-the-pot amount of people. A paltry number. Embarrassingly paltry number. 
Here's one that gets me very angry. The, the masses of asleep, hypnotized people, the so-called cattle, that are just going along to get along and are just in this total hypnagogic trance state. And they are perfectly comfortable, have been willfully, willingly hypnotized and put in that entranced state. See, let's not give too much credit to the social engineers. See, I've done, I, I did this earlier on in my speaking career, and I wish I could roll back time and take it back, because I, I place too much emphasis on the power of the mind controllers to put people in this state. Do you know how willing you have to be to really go into a trance mind state, an entranced state, a state of enchantment and entrancement? entrancement? You have to truly be willing at a soul level to allow that to happen to you. So once again, I ask, how many people percentage-wise are willfully giving over their power because it's the easy way out, because it doesn't take any work, you know? To go into this state takes no work. It's just fucking laziness and not wanting to really get involved and learn something and then do something with that knowledge. You know, that's easy. And that's why so many people are in it. Percentage-wise, are not more people in this state than in a conscious, awakened state like many of the people in this room are? The overwhelming vast majority of human beings are. I'm angry about that. Maybe if more of us were angry about that, deeply angry, with deep righteous indignation over this state, maybe more of us would become teachers of objective morality, of natural law, of the non-aggression principle in our communities. See, it's about making an investment of your time. Not just saying, yes, I agree, wonderful job, Mark, wonderful job, Max, wonderful job, you know, any of the speakers speaking here today, Derek, you know, Gina, anybody, okay, you know? It's about getting involved yourself. My goal is to take people up off of their asses in these seats and make them the teachers of these people that can help take them out of their entranced mindset. That's always been my goal. It's never been to have a big following of people. It's never been to individually reach every one of these people in the world because God knows I'm not powerful enough to do that. No one has that reach. But guess what? If every person here taught natural law, if every person here really taught morality to people all around them at all, almost all times and places, what, to whoever is within earshot, we might develop a fighting chance to come out of this situation of slavery. Maybe. It's pretty deep. It's pretty bad. But you know what? If I didn't think there was any chance, I would stop speaking. There's still a chance. It's a small one at this point. But these are the people we have to reach, and these, this is what our righteous anger over these people willfully allowing themselves to be conditioned into this trance is what should drive our behavior to become people who can, as alchemists, assist them in their awakening, because that's what the alchemical process is. The alchemist never awakens anyone. I've never awoken one person. I have only assisted other individuals in awakening themselves. That's what the true alchemist is, okay? An assistant in someone else's awakening process that can just show them the way that they need to go. And if they have the courage and the will, they can go in that direction and they can wake themselves up. But ladies and gentlemen, first, you've got to get mad. The process starts with righteous anger. The, these are the words of Howard Beale from the 1970 movie, the, the great movie Network. How many people have seen Network? Okay, now that's only about half the room, okay? Maybe, maybe 55 or 60% of the room. Everyone should be familiar with the movie Network because of the allegory about, not even the allegory, it's like a documentary really about how the media really works to mind control people. And the main character, Howard Beale, he said, all I know is that first you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being. God damn it, my life has value. This is what righteous indignation is about. It's ultimately coming from a place of love and self-respect. It's someone saying, 
I don't deserve to be treated like this. I have rights, and I deserve not to be aggressed upon. I deserve not to be treated badly. I deserve not to be enslaved. See, the, the base problem in all of this is self-loathing coming from a place of abandonment issues. And then that creates a sense that we're not worthy of something better. Beale, the character Beale in the movie Network is telling people, you have to come from a place of self-respect and self-value. And that starts by getting angry at how you're being treated as a slave. Okay? That's the righteous indignation I'm talking about here. That's the sacred gift of anger. I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. How many people are so angry they will not comply? How many people in this room still pay income tax? How many people are still working in a job that has withholding? Meaning you had to give a social security number to your employer and they are withholding money from your paycheck by a show of hands. Okay, that's less than I was expecting in this room. So that's, that's good. But that's still about 50% of the room, okay? Now, we're, we're a special instance group here, okay? You know, you look at that really societally all around us, it, that's going to drop to 0.0001% real quick, you know? All you'd have to do is extend the radius of this room a couple blocks and it would be 1%, okay? So, the point is, you have to get angry about what's being done with your resources, you know? I'm not willing to pay for the rape and murder of children. I'm not willing to pay for bombs being dropped on people that I've never met. So that's why I'm gonna withdraw. I'll find other ways to procure resources. But I'm not paying my enslaver. I will not do it. To the extent that I am empowered to avoid it, you know? That doesn't mean I will never buy anything in society. If I'm gonna present, I need a laptop. Okay, there's going to be sales tax. That's, that's an unavoidable one, at least right now. But how many of us are so angry that we pull back from things and say, I will accept the hardship that goes along with doing it differently because I will not comply with evil? See, the sacred anger is about saying no to evil. It's about, no, like what my shirt here today says, know your rights because those who will never say who don't know their rights in knowledge, intellectually, will never say no to the evil forces arraying around them. You know, we, the, that, this is the, that's the lost word. It's both K-N-O-W and N-O. No and no. Because in order to say no, you have to know what right is, what objective morality is. So anger, as I'm talking about it here today, is a sacred gift. It's a gift of creation. The fact that we can feel it in our physiology and express it for the purpose that it is intended to be expressed is actually what I call a sacred gift. Anger is much more than a simple emotion. It is actually an evolutionary force. Anger is a sacred gift of creation. It exists for a reason. When we feel and express anger for the right reasons, it can be transformed into a powerful tool to be wielded against injustice. Righteous anger is actually, actually an expression of true love from the source of all goodness, from, the, from creation itself. Righteous anger rises up when we realize that injustice is taking place around us and that we are obligated by heart-based intelligence, true care, True sacred anger comes from the heart. It comes from caring about what is right, caring for truth. From a place, we are obligated by heart-based intelligence to create positive change in a world that has gone morally astray. Focused, righteous anger can compel change and root out darkness and evil. Righteous anger is the precursor to true courage. I, I'm going to talk about this a little bit later in the presentation. Being angry for the right reason and purpose gets us to a place, actually, of activating our courage and our willpower. Without that, that fuel of anger, most of us never get to that place of truly taking action and developing that courage that is really needed to do that. 
When used correctly, this kind of anger can become a driving force in our battle for freedom. Anger is the correct emotional response when the human condition is slavery. Just imagine slavery going on and on, continuing around people, and they're not even angry about it. You know, people will be like, I hear people say, uh, my, my friend Joel, who uh, helps with uh, video editing at What on Earth is Happening, said, said to me, Mark, I, I make some of my, quote, normie friends watch your videos. I'll play some of them for, for them. And he said, the first thing they go is, I can't listen to this guy. He's too angry. What the hell could he possibly be that angry about? Never thinking there could be a valid reason. But they don't want to hear it just because it's imbued with righteous anger. But that is the correct emotional response. To not display the emotional response of anger in the face of slavery means something's broken. It, and it's not just broken in the human mind. It's something that's broken in the human heart and in the human soul. This is because there is an epigenics agenda. of so It's literal sorcery. It is what I call action at a distance sorcery. That's what epigenics is. It is actually conditioning people through mind control techniques and social engineering techniques to actually change the expression of their own genetics and their own behaviors. We are willingly going into an epigenics agenda. Epigenics beyond eugenics. Not, classical eugenics is physically killing people or altering genes to ex have a different expression as the outcome. Epigenics means you're, you're getting that outcome of the eugenics program, but you're doing it through mind control. You're doing it through socially engineering the thoughts of the people who are then propagating the characteristics and genes down to the next generation for expression. Meaning you don't even have to touch anyone in the population. You can mind control them so severely that then the, the genetic expression or the characteristics of the personality get expressed in that generation. You've actually socially engineered a, a biological, a new form of a biological human being according to your own specifications as the social engineer. And let me tell you something, folks. That's who the Satanists are. You want to talk about who they are? They are epi eugenicists. They are satanic epigenicists. That's who's running this society. I should know I worked with them for many years of my life, as most people here today know. But they have an agenda to eradicate especially righteous anger. They pretty much want to eradicate all of it. So I'm going to talk about what are the different components of this epigenics agenda to eradicate anger? Because it's a multifaceted approach and it has many different techniques. Okay? So, one of the big overarching components or the psychological operations of this epigenics agenda is the New Age movement. And, you know, look, first of all, I consider myself a spiritual teacher. Okay? Most people would hear a presentation like this and go, this is nothing like any other spiritual uh, teaching that I've ever heard in my life. I've gone to the New Age Expo, I've gone to the Mind Body Spirit Expo, all these, and I've never heard anybody talk like this. How could this be considered spirituality? Because this is spirit in the flesh, boots on the ground, okay? Yes, the stellar man and the stellar woman has their head in the stars, but their feet are firmly anchored upon the earth because that is where the great work is done. That is where the process of alch alchemical transformation takes place, right in the here and now. Not in some lofty, otherworldly realm or other dimension. It takes place within the self, in the here and now. Okay? So, the New Age movement, as I've always talked about, I have many lectures that I call New Age bullshit. There's three variants of it. Okay, This is about the suppression of the sacred masculine dynamic in our society. This is a stand-down movement. Get the people to stand down and accept everything, even if it's vile and evil. Acceptance, acceptance, acceptance. There are things we should never accept and never normalize. 
because there is such a thing as the objective difference between right behavior and wrong behavior. And when wrongdoing is being conducted, we should not let it run amok. We should strive to correct it by reaching people's minds and getting into, what, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Why do you even think that this is okay? You know, as Max said earlier, we all know the difference between right and wrong. We don't even need to be told. We know what it feels like to be wronged. Don't do that to other people. That's the golden rule. It's that simple. Okay? So in my lectures on uh, New Age bullshit, I talk about how one of the main principles of this psychological warfare operation called the New Age movement is never get angry. Teach people never express especially righteous indignation. Okay? They teach people this calmness, meditate, do yoga. Okay? The, those are negative emotions. A lot of the New Age movement, not all of it, okay, not a blanket statement, but a lot of them want to purge anger. Okay? They don't want the inner Hulk coming out. Okay? The Hulk was always my favorite comic book character, favorite Marvel superhero above them all. I, I, I just lo loved him above them all because I think I inherently uh, intuited and recognized that what he was basically a representation of is our very first right, the primordial human right. The right that supersedes everything else and comes first before every other right is the right to be left alone. And as many different philosophers have said in different ways, there are only two kinds of people on this planet, those who wish to be left alone and those who refuse to leave them alone. And when the Hulk wasn't left alone, you wouldn't like him. See, we need that inner Hulk, right? We, I, I say we need to go beyond even the Hulk. We need an inner psychopath. Because there's a very distinct difference between being a psychopath and having a psychopath. See, that now we're getting into deep, dark shadow material that many people don't, don't like to look at. But I would, I would look every person in the face and say, if you don't have a psychopath as part of your, the characteristic makeup of your personality, if you don't have one in that tool set, then you are an incomplete being. Not only that, I would say you have the beginnings, at least, of the characteristics that make a slave. And most people don't want to look at that. Because they want to think we're here to be somehow perfect angelic beings. And let me tell you something, folks. If you believe that, you've swallowed some new age bullshit. Okay? This is about very real world expressions. I've always tried to take it down to the expression of the higher form, the perfect form of the principle, and bring that down into the world and then apply it. Because knowledge and principles not actively applied in the real world aren't worth much. So, um, as part of this uh, presentation, uh, my uh, friend Nate did this awesome drawing, this awesome painting of, of me as the Hulk. He even put the Anarchadelphia symbol on the podium. You know, look at that. That is just brilliant. Got the Tesla coils on both sides. Thank you, Nate Cap. Just brilliant artwork. Okay, I figured that would, that'd be a little levity in the middle of something very serious, you know. The second part of this epi-eugenics agenda to purge anger is religious programming. And, you know, like statism is a religion, the New Age movement is a religion, and the influence of traditional cultural religions is as powerful as it has ever been. A lot of us in this movement don't want to acknowledge that. But I'm telling you, you really want to go to the depths of where this world is being controlled from. You need to look no further than actual, ostensible religious traditions culturally. Everybody says, oh, the world's run from Washington, D.C., New York City, Beijing, China. No, folks. The, the city of London, no, sorry, wrong. The world is run from... Rome, Israel, and Mecca. 
if you really want to know where the highest level controllers, the highest level dark occultists are operating from and have their palaces that they are keeping all of the hidden knowledge of this world, you need to look no further than the entrenched cultural religions, religious traditions. And their power is not on the wane the way people think that it is. It is just going into the covert form of becoming the new religion, which is government. That's all. You know, religion doesn't really go away. It just changes forms. And people think they're free of religion. They think because they're an atheist, they're free of religion, yet they still support the state. You know? They think because somehow they don't believe in cultural religious bullshit, and then they go into the New Age movement, or they go into wor the worship of money, that they have no religion. Plenty of people have religions that would identify as a religionless person. You're going to see a lot of them in the documentary screening tonight. People who are absolutely, uh, f uh, with religious devoted fervor, worshipping the entity known as government or the state. And yet, you would ask them, are you a religious person? And they go, oh, no, not at all. Bullshit. You are absolutely a religionist. Okay? So, what traditional religion teaches people is that anger is one of the seven deadly sins. Pride, envy, gluttony, lust, anger, greed, and sloth. Anger takes the place on that list, takes its place on that list. But you just think about these. Are these actual wrongdoings that we do to other people? Even if you were an asshole who has a lot of pride in themselves, right? Or a counterproductive pride even. Have you harmed someone? by having a way too lofty opinion of yourself? I'm not saying that's a good thing to aspire to. You know, like uh, injecting a whole bunch of heroin in your veins isn't a good thing to aspire to, but you have, you have the right to do it? Yeah, because you own your, bo own your own body. I'm not saying it's a good idea. But like all of these things, right? To want something that somebody else has. Well, hey, as long as you don't go and take it, go, go desire it however much you want. I wouldn't suggest living your life in that modality. You're going to be a miserable person. I'd rather you be miserable about not having freedom or not being allowed to express your inherent rights, you know. But, you know, if you want to go and be envious of what somebody else has that you don't, go right ahead. Just don't initiate harm against them. So you can go down the list of any of these things. These are subjective aspects you know, this is what moral relativism teaches. And there's tons of moral relativism in religion, you know? Because they'll tell you just, you know, uh, a drug dealer or a drug addict or a prostitute, etc., are immoral people. Well, if there's a, a, a consensual transaction between consenting adults, no immorality has taken place because no one's rights were violated because no one was coerced, harmed, or stolen from. All forms of wrongdoing are forms of theft, as we're going to see. So these aren't the seven deadly sins. I call total bullshit on religion for saying that these are the seven deadly sin sins and anger is one of them. The real seven deadly sins are the ways that we break natural law. The ways that we actually cause harm to other people. These aren't the seven deadly sins. These are subjective constructs of men who think they're the represent re representatives of God on this planet. And they're not only not holy men, they're holy bags of shit that are pedophiles and pedophile protectors. So this clown, this is the clown who was involved in the financial aspects of the Vatican that paid off family members, parents, who had children who were molested by members of the clergy. And then, in paying them off so they wouldn't go and report the crime, then they took the, the priest and funneled him to other parishes so he could do the same fucking cycle all over again. But that's a holy man who will tell you don't get angry because that's one of the seven deadly sins when he's protecting pedophiles. Benedict. Yeah, Benedict Arnold is more like it. Benedict whatever, the 16th, whatever he was. I, my open challenge for an MMA cage fight is still out to the current Pope. Like, get in the ring with me, bitch. Yeah. 
Still haven't heard anything from the Vatican offices. I, we're trying to make it happen. <laughs> These are the true seven deadly sins, ladies and gentlemen. The transgressions against natural law, the actions that, if we perform them, we are actually causing harm to our fellow brothers and sisters. Whether that be even in the animal kingdom, the human kingdom or the animal kingdom, okay? Murder. The taking without just cause of the life of another which does not belong to you to take. Assault. The taking without just cause of another well-being, uh, of another's physical well-being which doesn't belong to you to take. Rape. The taking of another's free will, sexual association and consent which does not belong to you to take. Theft is the taking of property which does not belong to you. Trespass is the taking of security in another's dwelling or living space which does not belong to you to take. Coercion is the taking of another being's free will which does not belong to you to take because that's the greatest gift of creation, our free will. And lying is the taking of another being's ability to engage in informed decision making accurately which does not belong to you to take or to sabotage. These are the true seven deadly sins, and if you just look at the characteristics of them, they are all taking something that does not belong to you, which is called theft. Every real wrongdoing, or quote-unquote sinful behavior, or transgression against natural law, is a form of theft. So compliance to natural law, the moral, the objective moral laws of the universe, the spiritual laws of the universe, is very simple. Don't steal. Two words explains the entire lesson that every being is on this planet to learn. Don't take that which does not belong to you. Don't steal. Because the real wrongdoings are all forms of theft in one form or another. And you won't hear that in the religious community. No way. You won't hear that in the New Age community. No way. Because they're part of this epigenic mind control program to purge our anger and to get us to think morally subjectively instead of morally objectively. And I'm angry about that. See, even in their own religious allegories, and again, just speaking to all the you know, people who will insist, uh, oh, if you throw a picture of Jesus in there, it invalidates anything you're going to talk about because he didn't historically exist. I'm not here to debate the historicity of the figure of Christ, okay? I'm talking about it from an allegorical perspective in the New Testament scriptures. I'm not an exoteric Christian, okay? I understand the true heart of the Christian tradition from the perspective of the golden rule as being alignment to natural law principles and objective morality. But even in their own allegorical scripture, Jesus was telling people that he wasn't here to make peace. He was not here to allow it all and just stand down and chill and be calm. Okay? He said, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but to bring a sword for I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Now that's strong language. Because what is the dividing line that he is talking about? He is talking about whether someone is actually an objectively, truly good, moral human being that understands the principles of natural law. That a right is an action that does not initiate harm to another sentient being. And all wrongdoings do initiate harm to other sentient beings in the form of one type of theft or another. And Jesus was angry about that, even whether you think it was a real person or you think it's just a biblical allegory. I tend to lean toward the allegorical perspective of the, the, the biblical scriptures. Okay? And I still value them from with that allegorical content. A lot, can, a lot of rich allegorical moral content can be garnered by even studying the cultural religions. All of them. Not just Christianity. So that's not what I'm here to debate or talk about. That, that historical perspective. But to actually look at what's being said here. Most Christians who consider themselves Christians in that, that, this tradition. 
I call them fake-ass Christians because they're not even really listening to the content of the message that was spoken by Christ in the New Testament. Did he never express anger? No. Incorrect. When the money changers were beating people for a whole lot of money and selling them spiritual indulgences, what did he do? He took out a switch and beat their asses with it and, and chased them out of the temple grounds because he said, you're, you're polluting what's supposed to be a holy place. You know, there was lots of expressions of anger, particularly in th this instance, in this story, the expulsion of the money changers from the temple. So even within the religious tradition, you know, the, 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 the whole agenda is to not even get people to look at what's even being said or why Jesus got angry even in their own writings. You know, they just want to sell people on the idea that, oh, being a good person means that you don't get angry. It's all part of the epigenetics agenda. Now, here's another big part of it that can get controversial, okay, because the number one way that they have us divided now in, in modern times is along gender lines. There's been a gender war happening for many years, for decades, and it's getting worse and worse. I love to see the mixture of genders here today. I mean, it's almost like a 50-50, almost like, like right under a 50-50 between men and women split here. Uh, and it's, it's good to see, especially that many women coming out to an event like this. It's very encouraging, okay? It means that the mind control is starting to wane, okay? Starting to. But you know what? A lot of the people that fall prey to this type of an agenda, they're doubling, tripling, quadrupling down. A common, common social engineering techniques within the neo-feminist movement. I did a whole lecture on this, as I'm going to point out, called the unholy feminine. The, uh, the satanic epigenics agenda was the subtitle. So this is about neo-feminism, or what most people are calling third wave feminism. Common social engineering techniques within the neo-feminism movement include programs to demean and emasculate the male gender to the point that men become unwilling or even unable to rebel against their occult masters and programmers. Men who still have their righteous anger intact still possess the capacity for rebellion. See, they want to eliminate the capacity for rising up against tyranny. That's why they want the weapons. So people never have the uh, capacity, if it's required, to physically rebel against them. I think we should always strive for the, you know, not having to do it through physical rebellious means because if you really want to accomplish it permanently, you have to accomplish it in a change in consciousness and a change in the heart and spirituality. But I am not going to take the option of physical rebellion off the table. Anyone who does that you're a fool. Anybody who doesn't own a battle rifle in this room is a fool. I'm armed right now. I'm armed. Every time you've seen me speak, I've been armed. You know? You just assume it. If I'm at the podium, I'm armed because I'm taking my self defense in my own hands. That's my responsibility and no one else's. You know? Too few people have that attitude, and it's because of this type of programming. Men who still have their righteous anger intact still possess the capacity for rebellion. The social programming of the neo-feminist agenda has most women conditioned to completely and utterly discount a man who displays anger for any reason whatsoever. I've actually heard that expressed by many different women. As soon as I see a, a man get angry, that's it, he's out. Off, off limits, I wouldn't even consider a relationship with him. I've heard it over and over and over and over again. And I'm talking about no, people I don't know. Like, I listen in social situations. And, you know, just the, like, you know, eavesdrop on a conversation that I happen to be with an earshot of. Hear what people are saying. Where is their mind? Where, 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 how much are they in the mind control trance that the social engineers put out there? And I hear it over and over again, you know? They don't even care about why they're angry. If there's any anger expressed, they want someone who never expresses it. I, I've heard it right from their mouth to my ear. No secondhand translation. So 
This agenda is also programming women to become radically opposed to firearms for the purpose of self-defense, especially for the purpose of self-defense against government, encroachment, and tyranny. The result of this programming among women dissuades men from expressing righteous anger for fear of being socially ostracized by most women. That's what's get, see this is what we're, I've explained in this presentation called the unholy feminine. Women don't even know really the extent of their true power as influencers in our society because of how much sway and influence you do hold over men in our society. But that power can be the sacred feminine influence or it can be the unholy feminine influence. And this is something I think should be discussed. I don't, I'm the only person I really largely in the anarchist movement here talking about this dynamic. And it's because I saw firsthand amongst the Satanists and social engineers that I worked with in the past an agenda to specifically target women with these tactics. Openly, they, they said that that's what was going to happen. Another big tactic was androgenization especially a group that I worked with right here in Pennsylvania, up by Allentown. The whole agenda of that group was pushing the androgenization of human society so there would be a blurring out between the distinctions between the genders and therefore people would become more uniform and thus easier to control. Very open among their own ranks about the actual agendas that they are pushing. They would deny it publicly, of course, but people that they think are totally on board and you know of the same blackened heart and mind as they are, as control freak Satanists, they're very open about what they have planned. And let me tell you something, they don't just talk about it. They didn't just talk about it, you know? It's not just a conversation I happened to hear them say and then they just went home and watched football. They talked about it and then they did it. These people don't play. They do what they say they're gonna do. They're driven through what I call dark care. You know, people think care is only a one-way street and it's only positive. No, there's such a thing as evil care, dark care. Psychopaths really, truly care about what they're doing and develop the willpower to carry it out. And they're not playing games. See, they're on a united front, we're on a divided front. This is the bit major overarching problem. We got to get people so on board with an understanding of objective morality and natural law and become committed to it. And, and again, as we're going to talk about when we play the documentary, as you're going to see, this isn't a religion. It's not a belief system. Natural law constitutes a science that requires no belief or faith. I'm the first person to tell you. I got up at, at Anarchapoco on stage in Mexico, and I, the first thing I, I broke out, my first slide, was religion is the one and only problem in our world. People have to stop thinking about religion as just the cultural ones. You know, neo-feminism is a religion that many people unfortunately have bought into. Anything that holds us back from the actual truth of what's really going on and what objective morals really are, I consider a religion. Because that's the defini definition of a religion. Something that holds us back from where we say we want to go. So this I consider, I'm very, very happy with how this presentation came out. It is probably one of my uh, most meticulously researched and detail-oriented presentations, The Unholy Feminine. So as an adjunct to this, you know, we see this coming through in cultural programming, okay? Because you will see a lot of men express this anger. And why a lot of them aren't expressing it is even more important. They're not expressing it because they think that's going to be the reaction from females all around them. And, you know, if, if a man is like a regular red-blooded man who is attracted to women, that's not the situation that they want to find themselves in. Okay? That's just the reality of the situation. You know, people want companionship, etc., intimacy, and if they are told they're going to be cut off from that, you know, this is like not complying with the banking system and so they cut off your chip and you can't buy and sell. This is just a different form of that. You express righteous anger, well then you're cut off from intimacy with females. This is actively happening. I know it's not happening in our community. You know, women in our community think radically different from this. But do you think this is not 
the overarching way that things really are in our society culturally. Cultural programming has gone so far as to embed in most women's minds that a man immediately becomes unattractive and undesirable for expressing the human emotion of anger. Purging the emotion of anger is part of a large-scale dialectic designed to weaken the population in preparation for a lifetime of servitude with no chance or capacity for opposition or rebellion. That is the total takeover. That is total enslavement. That's the true dark new world order from whence there is no return. But as long as there is sacred anger, we can po potentially turn our situation around. But it, it's all about what we do with it. Again, that was another thing that was talked about here repeatedly that I'm very glad the speakers went into. Things are dual-edged swords, right? It's about what we do with them. The occult is a dual-edged sword. It's hidden knowledge. But once we take it in, what do we do with it? Why has it been held back from us to create a power differential in society? The people who know the knowledge of the occult and who are you know, of the type of manipulative mindset to want to use that as a weapon against other people who are in ignorance, it's a piece of cake for them to do. Child's play. It's like uh, somebody that never learned mathematics going to buy something and they have a few hundred dollar bills and they go, I want a couple of pieces of candy and a piece of gum and a pretzel and uh, is this enough? I don't know how to add, I don't know what's here. And the person goes, thank you, yes, that was perfect, exactly. No, no change, have a good day. You know, really. That's what it's like. That's what the, the knowledge differential of the real occult controllers versus the population is like. You know, that, I'm trying to close that knowledge gap with my work by explaining to you these are their strategies. This, this is what cultural, this is what social engineering is all about. So what they want to create is part of the characteristic of what they call the new man and the new woman. The social engineers, the Satanists, the dark Luciferians, the mind controllers, doesn't make a difference what you call them. They're, they're the control freaks in this world who think they're God and want to micromanage society and dictate every detail of your lives. They have a phrase. It's called the new man or the new woman. Maybe some of you have heard this. It's, it's a, an esoteric term. It's not very heard in modern, in just, you know, regular circles. But if you look into the occult, you'll come across this term. The new human, okay? And what they want is to create the perfect slave whose soul has actually been broken that will accept its servitude. Aldous and Julius Huxley talked about this in their work because they were part of these social engineering programs. Um, Edward Bernays talked about this. He worked with the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations, you know, and perverted a lot of Sigmund Freud's psychological uh, tactics and, and uh, techniques. But they want to create beings, ultimately, long-term, that have lost the ability to feel anger. I'm going to say lost the ability to feel any kind of anger, but especially sacred anger. They don't want people expressing the sacred anger of righteous indignation. People who cannot become angry regarding the current human condition of slavery have literal brain damage. I'm going to say that again, and I really want you to listen to what I'm saying. It's not metaphorical, and I'm very serious. People who have lost the ability to become angry have literal brain damage, provably scientifically provably, through chronic brain imbalance in one hemisphere of the neocortical brain or the other, whether you become left brain imbalance or you become right brain imbalance, to such an extent, you can actually lose the ability to feel anger. And this is done through epigenics, action at a distance, mind control sorcery, and it's done through chemical warfare, which we are under and electromagnetic warfare, and the war on the chemical known as testosterone also. Chemical war, which is actually a, a life essence, okay? Important, as important for women as it is for men, and many people don't know that. 
Chemical warfare through food, water, and pharmaceutical pharmaceuticals attack the parts of the human biological system which create a healthy brain and healthy emotional responses. So they are targeting the part of the brain that would ordinarily function correctly to, co to produce the correct emotional responses in people. They want to break that part of the brain. And they, they have done it to a large extent. This result can also be produced through epigenetic means, through mind control. The goal sought by the social engineers of the ruling class is to disrupt the limbic brain, what is called the mammalian brain or the midbrain, the limbic system of the human brain, so that it will no longer produce the necessary neuropeptides required to generate emotions which the social engineers do not wish to see expressed in the population. And yes, this can be done and is actively being done. This process can actually be likened to a partial chemical lobotomy. But they're actually doing it through what they're putting in the water, what they're putting in our food, what they're hit bombarding us with electromagnetically, and what is in pharmaceutical drugs that people are unfortunately still taking. Those who have fallen prey to this control technique and have therefore lost the ability to feel righteous anger are actually broken souls. They have not just broken the brain or the mind. Doing what they have done to people to remove their ability to feel anger has actually broken them at a soul level. So they are broken souls who have been purged of a sacred gift which was actually their birthright as a human being. Such people who can no longer even become angry are the problem. Through their spiritual weakness, they have allowed themselves to become broken. See, again, I look at it like I almost did a disservice to this community by talking so much about mind control techniques. Because a lot of people kind of reacted like, woe is us. Oh, poor us. We've been under this you know, sorcerer's attack for so many generations. But we have to stop looking at it like that. We're willful participants in this. You know, when we allow ourselves to become spiritually weak and there's no shielding against these attacks, then we easily fall prey. That's like, you know, a, a couple of animals, you know, uh, wild animals run in and you just lay down and say, eat me. You know, with no resistance. That's what most of the human population has done. So people like that have... They've allowed themselves to become broken physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. They can no longer feel and process the full range of human emotional responses. They have become casualties of covert biological warfare. Occult biological warfare is what this is. Okay? This is truly silent weapons for quiet wars. The socially engineered not, they have become casualties of covert biological warfare waged upon the populace through silent weaponry. The socially engineered annihilation of the sacred gift of anger is creating a society of apathetic souls who don't care about the destruction of their own freedom or the freedom of others. And this is who we in this room must reach and heal. The brain and even the soul have high levels of plasticity, meaning they can recover from things that you would imagine they would never be able to recover from. Look up the plasticity of the brain, the plasticity of the mind. See, that's part of programmability, is that it's flexible. That's what plasticity means. It can be molded, shaped. And if it's even broken and torn apart, it can come back together. It can be reassembled, reunited with truth. Possible? Yes. Easy? No. I never said that it would be easy. It's extremely difficult work. That's why it's not called the one big happy-go-lucky party. It's called the one great work. And that is what we are here to do. Look, never... Having even the ability to feel anger 
right? I want to just talk about what it would be like, like from an allegorical perspective. And, you know, this is going to hit home with some people, right? Imagine, it's 1770, the Boston Massacre is actively happening. British soldiers who have been quartered in people's houses and are stealing things from people, raping people, you know, bursting into their home, just taking over their, their home and family life, you know, at the behest of a psychopathic king who thinks he's God, thinks he's the represent, representative of God on earth, you know, are now shooting American colonists in the street. And you can go on and on about why you think it started. It's irrelevant. Uh, you know, they, they were actively gunning down in the streets of Boston American colonists. And th this, you can imagine this taking place and people seeing their loved ones and, and friends die on the street right in front of them. And then one of them who's actively being oppressed goes, looks at one of the other ones who's like all enraged about it and goes, I just don't understand why you're so angry. Just can't conceive of this, you know? This is the people that say, I don't understand how you're so angry about this, this situation. Why don't you just teach it in a nice, oh, calm, dispassionate voice. Ladies and gentlemen, the human condition is slavery. <laughs> you know, like, like, really? Is that, a, is that genuine? Is that a genuine emotional response? We have to decondition ourselves to this shit. Because that's what it is. It's bullshit. It is literally like this, okay? When I was making this presentation, this is the slide that I had in mind from the ver very beginning, this next one. And... It should make people angry. Imagine back in the Civil War era during black slavery when slaves were being held against their will on plantations and forced to work under treacherous, insane conditions and they would be viciously whipped, treated, you know, tied up with chains, put in steel boxes in hot uh, weather conditions. Like, ridiculous. E eaten alive by dogs if they didn't comply. Dogs sicked on them until they were literally mauled to death. And other heinous atrocities, being strapadoed, this is a form of strapadoing. Although they would usually do it with the hands behind the back and then pull the person up on the rope before they whip them. That's the actual real strapado method. But imagine seeing a, a, a situation within, this is a tame drawing, folks. What it really looked like, you probably would not want to see, okay? Imagine a slave strapadoed and then a house slave who got better treatment than the rest of the slaves. It wasn't a field slave. He lived in the master's house and got better treatment, better food, better clothing, okay? And then all he had to do was keep the other slaves in line so the masters didn't have to hire other people to do it. That was the house slave's job. You know, they're the military and police of our day. You know, the house slaves of our day are the police and the military. You get, get as offended about that statement as you like. That's exactly what the situation is. But imagine other slaves on the plantation watching this scene of barbarity and brutality take place right before their eyes, which any of them knowing they could be next if they stepped out of line. And one of them turning to the horror, the look of horror of the woman, the, the women in front of him, and saying, I just don't understand why you're so angry. Imagine this. This is exactly what I feel like when I get this dumb fucking statement from people because that I'm just going to call it what it is it's people with uh you know that are as, as dumb as 10 pounds of shit in a five pound sack okay really you know to put it in street language you know that's what they sound like to me that's how stupid they sound why would you be so angry about human beings being enslaved and losing their rights can't imagine why that would bring up a seemingly negative emotional response of anger. No, that wouldn't be justified or correct. Folks, my level of anger is normal under the current human condition. If the condition were not slavery, I would not express the level of anger that I do. But the truth is the condition is slavery. And the correct emotional response is to be angry about it, so much so that you do something to end that immoral condition. Yeah. 
So why do we have so many totally brainwashed and conditioned people like that? Part of it is they're literally waging biological warfare, chemical warfare, weaponized drugs and water. I call the antidepressants, the SSRIs, the SNRIs, all of those, I call them the demon drugs. They're demon drugs with demon names. Prozac, Effexor, you know? Give me some other ones. Zoloft. Doesn't that sound like an alien monster coming to eat the planet? <laughs> Zoloft is going to be here any day. He's the devourer of worlds, you know? These are demon names. I'm not kidding. They're, they, are, they are invocation names. They come from a, a twisted form of the Goetic tradition of summoning an invocation of demonic entities. And they, they, literally, the Satanists who invent these things that are, that are running the medical industry are giving them invoke, in evocative demonic names. Literally. That's why they have all X's, Z's, you know, it's, it's like pretty soon all the vowels are just going to be going, they're going to be called, are you taking your you know? That's what the, the names are going to start sounding like. Today, or, you know, you're trying to wean off of that? Yeah, literally. But that's why they're named like that. And, you know, we all should know about fluoride in the drinking water. How many people either use exclusively for internal use distilled water or at least reverse osmosis purified water? That's excellent. That's like 75 to 80% of the room. That's good. We need to bring that up to 100%. Okay? But hey, guess what? How many people in the listening audience that are going to eventually watch this are doing that? And I guarantee you that number drops to like 5 to 10% if that. People are still drinking poisoned tap water. You know, stannous fluoride, hydrofluosilicic acid. These are That's a, a coctic chemical cocktail that actually reduces willpower and keeps people in this totally leveled state of emotional, you know, makeup that, where they can't really get angry. That's why Soviets used fluoride in their gulag, you know, detention centers for political dissidents. You know, it was a technique that they understood was going to weaken the willpower of the people that they were holding prisoner. Here's a thing I want to get more and more into in my work, and that's talking about people who are so into the left brain and are so overly analytical, you know, overly, you know, they say that they're scientific. They're not real. They don't really apply scientific methodology. I call them the eggheads, the left-brained eggheads, okay? You, look, these people are just as broken as the right brain, new age, you know, woo-woo people that are out there, you know, floating around in, in you know, the 22nd dimension and, and, and don't, don't have one, one uh, uh, even a sense of anchoring themselves in the real world. This is just the opposite dynamic of that. This is somebody that's all about, you know, analytics, verbal, math, all of that, right? And they could do tons of transforms of, of information and calculations, but they don't really have holistic intelligence because holistic intelligence is about not only the intellect but the generative principle of true care and creativity. That's why it's called intella, intellect, gens, generative. It's right in the word, right in the origin of the word is what it really means. So they, see, they don't have that holistic part because they're not working with the right mind. Right? They're not working with the caring, nurturing, creative aspect of the mind. They have that, that masculine, you know, uh, the, the linear processor, but they don't have the heuristic processor, the big picture thinking. Nor do they have the nurturing side of the personality that makes them care enough to get angry. So they don't have holistic intelligence. Why? It's not just the brain that, that isn't holistic in the left brain egghead types. And there's far too many of these even in the freedom community. What are they really lacking? They're lacking the place where true righteous indignation comes from, and that's the heart. Sacred anger doesn't come from the mind. The sacred form of anger comes from the heart because you care about truth and you care about what's right. And you're willing to put yourself on the line to make wrongs right so that injustice doesn't continue and we don't continue to lose our rights and freedoms but unfortunately these people don't have heart you know 
they don't have the heart to develop that level of anger because that's really coming from a place of care. And then we have amongst peop most people in our society the fear of rebellion. You know, this is also part of the destruction of the sacred gift of anger. And it's, it's not just men. It's men and women. You know, and, but, you know, I get the most upset about the loss of even wanting to right, righteously wanting to rebel. Even if you say, we're not going to do that now. I ask people, don't you think it should have already been done? Does the right exist? We have been held under violent duress. Of course the right to rebel against that physically exists. To, to think that it doesn't, you don't understand what your rights are. Every one of us would be right for taking physical action against the state right now in the moment, in the millisecond. I'm not saying to go out and immediately do that because unfortunately we don't have the minds and hearts of the rest of the population because they're still in a totally fucking brainwashed trance. And they don't understand that that would be a right. You know, so it wouldn't be a practical thing to do. But what, does the right exist to do it? You better believe it does. Absolutely. And this is something you say to the freedom community and they're like, whoa, whoa, don't start talking like that. Why not? What about the American colonists during the Revolutionary War era? They didn't have the right to do what they did to the British who were oppressing them and holding them under duress? Would the slaves of the Civil War era not have the right to physically rebel against their so-called masters? I've said it in my presentations before, they'd have a right to kill every single one of them. Every single one. For even participating in that bullshit. You know, I don't hear people talking like that in this community though. They're afraid to talk like that. You know, I'm not afraid of these people. I'm not afraid of them. I'm not afraid of the government. I'm not afraid of the police. I'm not afraid of the military. You are not spiritually awakened beings. You think you can make someone who is spiritually awakened and connected with the source of creation afraid of you? The only thing I have a, a, an amount of trepidation about is just allowing people like that to win and permanently take over. That's what we should be worried about if we're worried about anything. But I'm not physically afraid of them and what they can do to me. You ain't killing nothing if you blow this flesh away. First of all, I know this. Because to know that the fear of death is the beginning of slavery is what we all really need to deeply, that knowledge is what we deeply need to integrate. And why is that the case? That is the case because the flesh is not our identity. And this is where they have people believing that they, they should be a totally empowered, enlightened, awakened spiritual being stepping into the truth, which is what gives us our power, and they're curled up in a fetal position in the kingdom of the self, not even understanding their potential or power. And this is where most people are. And that starts with eradicating righteous anger. You know, they, they tell us about this allegorically. Hollywood puts a lot of these, this content allegorically out in, in modern films. Steven Spielberg, who made uh, TX, uh, THX 1138, his first film, you know, th this is somebody that was uh, largely given this script to talk about. You know, this was put up by like a, a production company that he had other writers working within, and they came up with this, and he ran with it, made it his first film, okay? So, um, you know, this one is about the order followers destroying their sense of self. And they're going about their, you know, oppressive job totally calmly. Like, no, it's perfectly normal. You know, and even the people, they're put on drugs. They're put on pharmaceutical drugs. Those are the demon drugs, the SSRIs, the, the antidepressants, the SNRIs, all of that. And they're told, you can actually be jailed for or, or, or fined for not taking your medication. You know, 
This is drug crime for not taking the drugs. Equilibrium, one of my favorite movies of all time. I consider it probably the most esoteric Masonic film ever made, if you really understand the symbolism going on in this film. Uh, this is about a society uh, that is, has eradicated emotion, a totalitarian society run by a uh, father who's supposed to be the representative of God on the earth as government, you know, um, basically has taken over society and they give people a drug called prosium, right? Almost identical to Prozac and that keeps them numbed out. Well, some people stop taking it, they start feeling again. The main character is Christian Bale, right? Now this is, I think, a synchro mysticism uh, example because Christian and Baal, you have the Christ and you have the devil, right? Christ and Baal, right? But they're in the one character. They're in the main actor of the film, right? And what he has to do is find his righteous anger. And he, he eventually finds it when he realizes they're destroying everything that's good and pure and wholesome and beautiful in the world. And they, put, they destroy art and they destroy animals. And finally, when he develops an, an emotional attachment to a dog, and they, the state wants to kill that dog, that's when he finally starts taking action, because he can't take it anymore. And, uh, you know, the whole crux of the film is him developing the anger to eventually say no, the lost word, when he flatlines, his emotions flatline, because that's the psychopath coming out and him doing what he has to do physically at that point. And that's when he goes into battle with father, and they do this uh, kung fu thing called gun kata, gun kata. And uh, they are fighting with guns, and eventually he disarms the totalitarian regime's leader, and he's standing there saying, could you take my life? I, you've disarmed me, and you want to take me out of the world? He goes, I live, I breathe. Will you pay the price for killing me unarmed? And the main character says, I'll pay it gladly, and pulls the trigger. One of the greatest films ever made, as far as I'm concerned, because it really teaches you, it's expressing the right of what one has to do when they are held under physical duress as slaves. The right. Not saying go out and do that, but saying let's start by understanding that the right exists. I talk about in my work that I delve into the Western mystery traditions, and Thelema is one of the traditions that I study very deeply. And one of the principles in that occult tradition is human beings have the right to kill those who would thwart their rights. This is part of the self-defense principle, the sacred masculine that must be wed to the sacred feminine principle of non-aggression. First and foremost, do not initiate harm. But when harm is initiated unto you, you always maintain the right to defend yourself with physical force. Up to and including deadly force. Highly controversial. You'll hear very few people talk about this, even within this movement other than myself and occasionally Larkin Rose. But all too few have the balls to say anything like that. And then another one that I just recently saw, similar to the name, because this is about, you know, Eat, leveling people out, making them all the same, right? So they, they, they can be brought into compliance. There's no individuality or uniqueness. Equals. Another society that has totally purged emotion. Also check out, here's another one of those names close to, you know, uh, the demon drug names, Zardoz. Okay? Check out the movie Zardoz because there's a, a, a group of beings in that called the apathetics that have lost their ability to feel emotion. You know, we should aspire to a high dynamic emotional range and a high dynamic emotional makeup and speak with passion from the heart. Too few people do it because they're in fear, which I'm going to talk about right here. This is actually a slide from the researcher uh, David Hawkins, who wrote the book Power Versus Force. I highly recommend his work, although I think he stopped short of understanding some of the really deeper esoteric and occult principles that need to be understood. His basic premise when it comes to gauging human consciousness is actually very informative and valuable. So where is anger on the scale of a whole dynamic range of human consciousness? It's not going to be 
perceived here, even in my, this slide that I'm using to illustrate this point, as very high in consciousness. Here's where anger is. I'm going to blow this up to show it to you a little bit more in depth because I think it's that important. Here's where anger is, and his scale goes from zero to a thousand, with zero being death, okay, and a thousand being total enlightenment or godlike consciousness insofar as that we are really embodying uh, the, the, the true principles of seeing ourselves as uh, all together as one consciousness in, in unconditional love. That's the very highest expression, which would be at a thousand. And the scale is logarithmic. It is not linear, okay? So anger is right here. And you'll notice that it is just before you get to that green heart energy, right? It's the beginning of where you're seeing the green spectrum as it's being illustrated in this image of the, the spectrum of colors uh, in, in, in uh, you know, the, the visible range, the visible spectrum. Green, I've always talked about as the center. That's the balance energy. It's heart energy. That's why I used it for the heart instead of most people choose a red heart. The Anahata Chakra in the Indus Valley tradition you know, uh, of the Vedas uh, is in the chakra system green. It's a green six-petaled flower that is the seed of life because it's the generative principle from which anything good really grows, okay? But this is where anger is. It's a little bit below that, but it's starting to go up, up into that green range. Now, in Hawkins' work, he talks about this critical point in consciousness that is the number 200. And that is very coincident, not so coincidentally, I should say, but very synchronistically, courage. Courage is the embodiment of this 200 line. And look at where it falls, right in the middle, in the green, the, the heart-based care center of the visible spectrum. People think of courage as active, right? As something that's done with action. But no, courage also comes from care. It stems from care. The courage to do what is right comes from first caring about what is right. And what gets you to that place of care is becoming first getting angry. See, that's the whole principle. First, you have to get mad. That anger comes up into the, the heart. It wells up in the heart because you care about what's right and you care about what peop whether people have the freedom to express their rights. Okay? So I'm talking about courage here, here as a stepping stone to get to that place of courage to act, to get into right action. So I'm going to end by talking about the transformation, the alchemical transformation of the sacred form of anger into right action, courage and right action. Now, interestingly enough, look at what that 200 line is in David Hawkins' work. It is act, in his work, it represents the ability to discern truth from falsehood. And that is why most human beings do not have that capacity or ability. They're not even angry enough. They haven't even developed the self-respect to say, I'm angry, I don't deserve to be treated like this, my life has value and I'm not going to take it anymore. They need to develop that anger that then they can use as fuel to convert it into courage and take right action in the world. So let's talk about the alchemical transmutation of anger into courage. Because this is what it's about, right? It's not just about feeling something. It's about what are you going to do with it? What's the difference if you could feel it if you're not going to take right action with it? St. Augustine said, Hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage. Anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain as they are. Brilliant quote. Anger can actually be a motivating force or what I call a fuel. It can be like a rocket fuel, literally, okay? Sacred anger. The bridge from anger to courage is built by channeling anger into focused right action directed at overthrowing the system of slavery that currently binds us. That means getting involved and talking to other people in the world about the issues that we need to face and change. 
by teaching them about objective morality and natural law, we can turn the tide in the war for human freedom. Anger over our rights and freedoms being taken away can be transmuted into the fuel that can drive the entire freedom movement. See, it's all about input, processing, and output. That's the trivium, okay? Grammar, logic, rhetoric, another way of saying it is input, processing, and output. We have to take the emotion of anger into ourselves and feel it and channel it and then let it come out. That's the ignition, the burning of the fuel of the sacred anger and the propulsion system toward courage and right action to take us where we say we want to go. That's the alchemical transmutation. It's not just about keeping it all bottled up and, and, and indwelling in the body and in the psyche. It's about what are you going to transmute that anger into? You can get into a dangerous, you know, playing a, a game here of, you know, striking that balance, walking that line. I know I can. I can get, get angry to a point where it almost becomes debilitating. And I'm, I'm saying that's not the right way of approaching this. It, it's a hard thing, though, to manage and deal with, okay? Especially when you're as a pa passionate about this as I am, because I want to see what the human potential is. I don't want to see us stay what, what we've, we're expressing here. I know that there's so much better expressions of consciousness than what we're allowing to happen here. I want to see what we're capable of. That's another thing that drives me and is part of my motivation. But we have to convert that fuel of anger into a pro propellant, into a propulsion system that drives our right action through courage. Focused and channeled anger. Focusing and channeling anger. Anger is a fuel that can be focused upon a situation that needs to be changed. It can be used wisely or frivolously. Again, that dual-edged sword. Are you going to put fuel in your car and go random impulse shopping? Or are you going to put fuel in your car and go travel and meet up with other like-minded individuals to try to make some positive change happen in the world? There are two different uses for fuel, just like there are different uses for anger. I'm not suggesting to dwell in continuous, useless rage. I'd never suggest that to people. You will destroy your immune system. Okay, Your body will suffer as a result. I'm talking about focused, channeled, righteous indignation here. That's the sacred form of anger. But when we consciously channel the fuel of anger toward a productive purpose, it can become a creative tool toward the betterment of our society and our world. And that's what we have to do. We have to transmute it into something creative and then make positive change happen as a result. And part of doing this is what I call integrating the shadow self. Okay, I just talked about not being a psychopath, but having the psychopath in case you do need to turn your emotions off to physically defend yourself. You know, when you're defending somebody, you better, when you're defending yourself against brutal violence being conducted upon, initiated upon you by someone, you better not have too much empathy toward them. You better do what's required to put them down as quickly as possible because the more that encounter goes, the more exponential of a chance you have of being maimed or killed. That's one of the main principles they teach in any true self defense or true martial arts. But what I'm talking about here is the integration of the shadow side of the personality. Okay, And this is one of the deepest parts of occult work that most people don't want to do. They don't want to even look into what the occult is, let alone do this. This is the thing where even people who say, I'm going to go into the deep waters, when you start showing them here's what it really is to delve into the human psyche at a very deep level, then they're running the opposite direction. Okay, That's why there's so few occultists in the freedom movement. And that's why there's so few actual genuine light occultists in the world. We are, the true lodge is scattered to the four winds of this planet. And we need to reassemble it. So the shadow self can be described as a seemingly dark or negative part of our subconscious mind. And I put those in double quotes because just like anger is not only negative and has a positive side, so does the shadow self. We have to work with it. The subconscious knows and perceives all. And it is the connection to the true spirit within us. 
our shadow self, if not worked with and properly integrated into our personality, can be expressed in severely imbalanced ways, especially when anger is suppressed or not used properly. Under such conditions, the imbalance builds at the subconscious level and is then manifested in counterproductive ways, such as becoming angry about frivolous things, about the wrong things that we shouldn't get angry about, or unjustly lashing out at others, etc. The shadow self is always present in our psychological makeup, whether we choose to acknowledge it and work with it or not. Ultimately, it really cannot be ignored. It's going to express in one form or another. Various methods of social engineering strive to mask and suppress our shadow self, uh, allowing subconscious anger to turn into depression and eventually into shame, which as we saw on the slide with David Hawkins' scale of consciousness, is the last level of consciousness before physical death. And that is where most of humanity dwells in the consciousness called shame. And it is because they haven't done this integrative shadow work, okay? It is because they've allowed that subconscious anger that's always there in the subconscious, which knows all, to eventually turn into depression for not acting on it rightly, and then eventually into shame, which is continuous self-loathing for not having done the right thing. Shame is the lowest level of consciousness in which a human being can dwell while still being physically alive. The shadow. In Jungian psychology, the shadow or shadow aspect is part of the unconscious mind, consisting of repressed weaknesses, shortcomings, and instincts. Everyone carries a shadow, Jung wrote. And the less it is embodied in the individual's conscious life, the blacker and denser it is. See, this is why I say I was a, an easy work to come out of the, the case of ego that I had, even as a Satanist. I worked with Satanists and dark Luciferians in their eugenics agenda for years of my life, knowing what they had planned for the world and watching it unfold. But guess what? There are people who make me look like an easy case of transformation. That's how hardened their ego is because they will not dredge up the shadow side of the self and work with it and acknowledge their, in, their um, lack of perfection, acknowledge their weaknesses, acknowledge the th the, their shortcomings and failings and things that they have not done to the way that their potential could, they could arrive at. But it's okay acknowledging those weaknesses. That's part of being honest with yourself. I have done bad things. I have failed. I am not perfect. I can be an asshole. Okay, et cetera, so forth. This is what the first step of occult initiation is. What is the first step of occult initiation? Stop lying to yourself. Most of us are still telling ourselves a bullshit story. So... It may be, in part, one's link to more primitive animal instincts, which are superseded during early childhood by the conscious mind. Okay? Please look into the shadow self, the, the shadow work as part of the occult. I know there are a few people who do this type of work who are here. Okay? I actively work with the type of dark aspects of, of the personality that needs to be worked with as shadow work. I know Jay Parker does that. I know Seth Boza does that. I know Logan Hart does that. There are many people that are getting into more aspects of dredging up this subconscious shadow material. That's the only way it can be dealt with and transmuted. And most people don't want to do that work. And that's the inner spiritual occult work that we must understand needs to be done and then perform it upon ourselves. That's inner alchemy. And Jung could have been considered an alchemical practitioner. So I'm going to conclude by talking about my personal anger in this war for our freedom. And I can feel like this many days. You know, I'm not impervious. My shields are stronger than most, I acknowledge. I have some characteristics of my personality that really make me be able to take a hit. Okay? But I'm not invincible. No one is. Okay? And I feel like this more days than not recently. 
Many people criticize my work by saying things like, Mark Passio should be taken with a grain of salt because he's angry and down on people. They fail to see that my anger comes from the fact that billions of brainwashed people believe in a fantasy religion called authority and vote to allow a group of criminals calling themselves government to take away our inherent rights. I'm angry because the vast majority of human beings totally agree with and support such violence and slavery. As a matter of fact, they love it. But why shouldn't anyone and everyone in the world be justifiably angry about the state of slavery that human beings are condoning and perpetuating? My emotional reaction regarding this situation is the correct one, and I'm not afraid to say it. I'm not interested in hearing from people that think I need to keep calm and just think positively of those who have allowed the human condition of slavery to manifest and continue. No, I don't need to accept that. No, I don't need to allow that. No, I don't need to tolerate that. And yes, I should be angry about that, and so should you. Thank you. And you know what? When you ask them, when you, when you turn the tables on them and you say, look at what I've done. There's my body of work. Go look at it, how proliferous it is. Okay? And you ask them, what have you done? Yeah, that's what you hear back, okay? So, almost every one of these so-called critics have never done anything on their own to try to help anybody understand true morality or their slavery here on this planet, and yet they'll spend their time, they think an effective use of their time is they'll spend their time and energy criticizing me, a person who has dedicated my life to this kind of work, while they've done nothing. And I'm not supposed to be angry about people like that either. Just imagine if you dedicate, you, you for, for when, you, you, you just, you, you foregoed every single aspect of pleasure you could have pursued in your life. Any kind of wealth you could have pursued in your life. Any kind of, you know, projects that you just wanted to do for you to do work like this to teach people morality and teach people what is really going on in the human condition. And then you get critics telling you, I'm not gonna listen to you because you're angry and I'm gonna go and try to tell people not to listen because you're angry about slavery. How would you feel? Okay? And then people will go, oh, Mark, it's just a few bad apples. It's just a, it's a few people, it's just a few bad apples. Let me tell you something, folks. It's not just a few bad apples. Okay, the whole bunch needs to really reevaluate themselves as how they think of themselves as good people. The dark occult controllers of humanity aren't the main problem. Are they a problem? Yes, but are they the main problem? No. The influence that they direct on society is not the causal factor of human suffering on this planet. It is a symptom of it. The vast bulk of the human race is the cause of their own and each other's suffering. In their colossal ignorance of natural law and their overwhelming inability to even become angry in the face of their own slavery, they will go along with and even carry out the agendas for the ruling class elitists who tell them what to do. It has much less to do with the small groups of psychopaths giving the orders than it does with the people who will follow orders or just stay silent in the midst of evil. And that is the majority. In the aggregate, human beings are a species who continue to willingly listen to psychopaths and carry out their immoral orders of violence and coercion. And they condone it. And for these reasons, humanity as a whole has become a disgraced species that has actually enslaved itself and is dwelling in the consciousness of shame. That this is the human condition is why we should be angry. To change the human condition by ending slavery and creating a world based in true freedom is our collective one great work. And let me tell you something, folks. As I said previously, it's not called work for a reason. And if you want to hear what it really entails on a day-to-day -day basis, 
come to the workshop on Monday because I'm going to explain to you what type of a Renaissance man and Renaissance woman it does take. Now, I'm not saying that to discourage people because I think there are many of those Renaissance people in attendance here that absolutely can be converted into powerful teachers of morality and natural law. But you have to learn what the skill sets required. But most of all, you don't want to get blindsided by not realizing and fully recognizing the sacrifice that it takes to do this. Okay? Ask people who work with me, and they will explain to you how much of a plodding, trudging process this is. That you make a little bit of progress each day and then you just continue to do it. And it can be maddening, okay? This work here, it, it, you know, I feel like that guy on the left saying, what is this all for? I say it all the time. I express that for cathartic purposes. I don't intend to give up, okay? I, sometimes I need a break to refocus and recharge and refuel, okay? This work here is called, it's a Masonic work called Called from Labor, from the... Uh, the occult tradition of light Freemasonry, true Freemasonry, esoteric Freemasonry. And it represents care and death. And it represents one of us in the consciousness of care that is doing the work to raise the consciousness of humanity, the broken pillar, okay? And the, the sprig of acacia is the Masonic symbol of the hope of the resurrection of the human soul. Out of the, de the, the, the spiritual death and up to a place of spiritual enlightenment and being in the true will and, and the, the consciousness of true care. So, and we only have so much time to do that because death waits for us all. That's what this is showing us. A very high, you know, positive allegorical picture in the Freemasonic tradition, okay? And we should use our time wisely that we have because we don't have unlimited time to get this work accomplished. And if you're not in it to accomplish it, you're not in it. It is about achieving the result. You hear too often in the, in the uh, New Age movement that it's not about the result that you'll get on the other side. Well, you know what? In, when it comes to a war for freedom, either you win and you're free in every way, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically, or you're a slave, okay? So the great work is all about sacrifice. It's about sacrificing your individual selfish lowercase w will for the gigantic uppercase w will of the will of creation. Let that will, not my will, be done, okay? And to wrap up here, people always ask me, how do you continue, even in the face of seeing how bad things are? And they're bad. How do you continue on? How do you find the strength to continue? And I'm going to end by telling people that I have a secret. So this is my secret, folks. Dr. Banner, now might be a really good time for you to get angry. That's my secret, Captain. I'm always, I'm always angry. angry. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and attention. <laughs>